All right, my name is Nemo Basu. I direct an organization in Nigeria called Health of Mother Earth Foundation. One thing, one thing that I've seen in my years of struggle is that even it's something like environmental pollution is not neutral, it's not politically neutral, it's a political activity. Because if transnational corporations pollute your environment or erode or diminish your biodiversity, they're actually assaulting you so that you can become dependent on them. So it's a way of grabbing your resources and take away your ability to defend yourself and to take care of your own needs. When your livelihoods are destroyed, then you become dependent on jobs that will not pay you, give you the kind of life that really has meaning. the destructive behavior of oil and mining company is the same all over the world. I've never seen a place where they behave in a way that is acceptable. And so there's nothing like sustainable mining or sustainable oil extraction, sustainable usage or extraction of gas. They all mean displacement, they mean human rights abuses, they mean they really damage the economy and the, and the environment. Uh, so in, my, in the particular context in which I work, which is in the Hydro Delta context about, with regard to oil extraction, oil has been extremely destructive. 60 years of oil has meant extreme pollution of water bodies, creeks, rivers, streams, lands, and even the air, because there are gas furnaces burning for decades, nonstop, uh, pumping very toxic elements to the, into the atmosphere. Now, communities have been resisting this. They resisted by litigating, going to court against the oil companies. There are many cases in the Nigerian courts that are cases against companies like Shell in, in, the, in The Hague, in the UK. There have been cases against Chevron in the United States. There, have been, there is a case building up right now against any in Italy. And so the people have been following very uh, peaceful resistance to these degrading activities of the oil corporations. But this has not been very easy because the entire Niger Delta has been militarized, uh, so much so that you have so many security services, agencies around, but that actually translates to insecurity. So the more you have security agents, the more you feel insecure. This is the reality of the communities in the oil sector, in the oil field communities. And if you, if you look back to the early 90s when the Ogoni people first began to mobilize to show that discontent against the degrading activities of Shell in their communities. The company working with the military dictator in those days actually brought about a, a scorch earth kind of operation where hundreds of people lost their lives, killed, and then the most a uh, widely known case was the arrest of the who the group that's been known as Ogoni Nine, which is Ken Salawewa and eight other Ogoni leaders who were held by the military and executed on 10th November 1995. Uh, why were they arrested? The whole thing was to pacify the Ogoni people, make them to silence them, to so that they would not make any demands on the system. So the system, which is the oil corporation and government, has been totally against the interest of local communities and the interests of the environment itself. And so in 1993, when the people of Ogoni rose and said, we've got enough, that really brought about a turnaround in environmental activism in Nigeria, environmental justice advocacy in Nigeria, community mobilizing in Nigeria. But again, this ended in a very sad note in 1995, 
when these heroes of the people were executed. Shell was expelled from Ogoni in 1993, and the executive council were in 1995, hoping that this would open the way for them to go back. But till, till date, the Ogoni people are still standing strong against the reopening of those wells. So Shell is unable to to go back to Ogoni line to extract crude oil. Now, so this is one aspect. The other aspect has been there's been a lot of divide, divide and rule tactics. Uh, against various ethnic nationalities in the region. But again, people have become wise to this. So people have declarations and demands. The Ogoni have the Ogoni Bill of Rights, the Joe have the Kaima Declaration, Oron people have the Ogoni Bill of Rights, the Yoruba people in Nigeria have their own demands. And they, so the people have actually documented their demands, which are political, cultural, economic, for, for rights, for people to live in dignity in their own environment, to be able to carry out their livelihoods. But again, with all the mobilizing and all the struggle, we're just, it's just the highway to freedom is still long, apparently. But I believe that one day we'll get to the top of the mountain. Because the people are resolved and committed to stand strong against this kind of misbehavior in their territories. And the good thing, again, is that the resistance is spreading, is spread, and their connections with other communities in other countries in Africa, with countries in Latin America, uh, in parts of Asia, and even in the global north. So it's a global resistance against oil extraction. In terms of resistance against mining itself, there's a network called Yes to Life, No to Mining. People are saying we want to live. Mining does not support life. For oil, we have Oil Watch International, which has groupings in Latin America, in Af Oil Watch Africa, Oil Watch Southeast Asia, and of course, globally. And so all this brings about with, with spaces for people to share, to share ideas, share their pains, share strategies, and stand strong against uh, this kind of thing that we witness in the oil field communities. Uh, so we've seen a situation where a chief economist of the World Bank wrote some years ago that underpopulated countries in Africa are grossly underpolluted, and that it makes impeccable economic sense to pollute, to dump toxic waste in those countries. So when you have that kind of political philosophy, then then allows you to, to, to become economic outlaw anywhere in the world. And then if you see the case of many countries in the global south. The structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and early 90s, which were designed by the World Bank and International Monetary Fund, actually helped to destroy agriculture, destroy public investment and productivity, uh, diminish the capacity of public sector to take care of the citizens, reduce the availability of good education, health services, and the safety nets for the people. All this has been done to destroy the economic fabric and weaken the webs of resistance in countries that have been recolonized more or less. So we have a clear case of neocolonialism uh, on the platform of neoliberalism, where everything that makes that would make a country resilient is turned on its head. Don't protect your people, don't educate your people, don't grant basic uh, right to workers. Uh, don't protect your environment, uh, feed the metropolis, just keep on being the storehouse. And, you know, when you look at all this, you just get to think that sometimes uh, the oppressors and the exploiters would like to see large territories devoid of human population. So it would just be storehouse for resources. And this is what we're fighting against, because we have a right to live the right to not just to live but to live in dignity and mother earth has a right to maintain her natural cycles so we can't allow continuous uh brigandage to go on unchallenged